Oops, hold on a second. All right. <clears throat> and so, of course, the, the title of this part is What is a Narthex, an Anglican Glossary? So we're going to start by talking about the parts of the building. And the first one, of course, is the narthex. So this is the entryway of the building, what a lot of churches would call the foyer or the lobby. In the Anglican church, we call this the narthex, and it is simply the entrance of the church. Uh, oftentimes, churches will put their baptismal fonts in the narthex because baptism is how we enter the church and we enter the church through the narthex so it's a it's a nice symbolism there and then you have the nave now most protestants will refer to the entirety of the worship space as the sanctuary someone says well we're going to go into the sanctuary you know that they are referring to the entirety of the space where the congregation worships. Uh, but as Anglicans, there are actually different names of uh, different places within the worship space. So the place where the congregation sits is known as the nave. Uh, and that comes from the same root word where we get navel. Um, and so it's referring to a ship or a hold. And so this is where the congregation sits. If you've got pews in the nave, then you've got the aisle that runs down the middle. Uh, back in the medieval days, when churches were used for multiple purposes, oftentimes you would have markets that would go on in the church in the winter in the nave. Um, Animals would sometimes be housed in the nave. People would come for protection against invaders or against weather, all sorts of things. And so a medieval nave actually didn't have pews. It was just a big empty space. Uh, if you go to Europe and go to some of the, the older churches, you'll notice that they just have chairs set up in the naves. And that's because the pews in the nave are more of a, a recent addition to these spaces. But this is essentially the area where the congregation sits. And then a lot of churches, especially in a traditional cuneiform church design, will have what are known as transepts. And these are little wings that come off the sides. Uh, and you'll see them outlined in red in this diagram. And the reason for this is because they wanted to design churches to look like a cross. And so you have the, the long centerpiece and then you have the shorter cross piece. And so the transepts are the shorter cross piece. Now, if you look at any of my drone pictures of All Saints, you'll see that we actually are in a cuneiform or a cruciform shape. Uh, the church is in the shape of a cross, but you look at it and you wonder, well, where are the transepts in our church? Well, the transepts of All Saints are actually our sacristy and our storage room. So there are two rooms that typically people don't see. Uh, but if you look at it from an aerial shot, you can see those two short wings that are our transepts. Now the area up front where the choir sits is known as the chancel or the choir. Um, in, a, in a traditional medieval um, church setting, you'll have a couple steps up into the choir, and then there will be a separate place where the altar is back beyond that. At All Saints, because we are designed in a English Reformation style, the, the choir and what's called the sanctuary are all part of the same space and the, so that's simply known as the chancel. So the chancel is the forward part that's uh, separated from the nave and it's there are usually a couple steps it's on a raised level. And then the sanctuary is the area where the altar is. So if <laughs> if you ask an Anglican how many people can you seat in your sanctuary? If, if it's a real Anglican, he'll probably say, well, maybe three or four or five or six, because the sanctuary is simply the area around where the, the altar is. 
oftentimes, again, in, a, in an old school cathedral design, you'll have an altar rail that separates the choir from the sanctuary. At All Saints, the, our altar rail is down actually in the nave um, below the chancel. And then you have what's known as an apse, and this is a curved area in the back of the sanctuary. And you can see a really big apse in this picture. We actually have an apse at All Saints, and that's where our chapel is. Uh, and, and I will admit, I've never, before I came to All Saints, I had never seen a church that made a chapel out of their apse. It's, a, it's an interesting place to put a chapel. I'm not sure I would have put it there, but, uh, but any curved area back behind the altar is known as the apse. And then the sacristy, this is just our fancy name for a liturgical kitchen. This is an area where the altar guild, which is the, the group of people that are responsible for taking care of all the vessels and the linens, this is where they prepare those vessels for Sunday morning worship. So our sacristy is off to the side in one of our transepts. And if anyone's interested in seeing our sacristy, if you've never seen it before, I'd be happy to show it to you someday. All right, so those are the parts of the building. Now let's talk about the furnishings. These are the things that are in the building. The first thing we want to talk about are pews. And the pews are just the benches in the nave where people sit. And as I said, pews are actually a fairly recent addition to, to the nave. Um, back in the old days, they wanted to be able to use that really as a multi-purpose space. Uh, as it became dedicated really to, to only worship, they brought in benches that became a little more permanent. Um, what's interesting is a lot of churches are trying to get away from pews because pews are too churchy and we don't, for some reason, we don't want church to feel like church anymore. But I heard a story about a church that sold their pews because they wanted to get chairs to make their church feel more like a coffee shop. But what was interesting is um, they sold their pews to a coffee shop. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure how, how much they were making their, their church feel like a coffee shop if a coffee shop was buying their pews to use in their coffee shop. Uh, oftentimes, if you look at these pews, you can tell these are pretty uncomfortable pews. And I think oftentimes they were designed with really straight backs as a way to keep people awake during long sermons. Um, with it, in the choir, you will often have seats that face each other. This is called antiphonal seating. And this is where the choir sits. Now, when we think of choir, we usually think of musicians or singers. Uh, in the old days, the people who sat in the choir were the people who were literate, who could follow along with the service. And so you would have the people who were really participating in the service sitting in the choir stalls facing each other. And then the people in the congregation, most of whom didn't know Latin and weren't aware of what was going on in the service, and they would just sort of mill about. They had uh, bells that they would ring called sanctus bells at certain times in the service to let people know something important is happening now. And actually, the I may have mentioned this in a previous class, that term hocus pocus, where we get sort of, that's the magic word. And that comes from the liturgy in the consecration prayer when the priest would say, this is my body in Latin, that is hocus corpus. Uh, and so they would hear that, they would ring the bell so you would know something special was happening. And people would say, oh, they just said the magic words, hocus pocus. Um, but these days, it's usually the singers that will sit up in choir stalls. If you go to someplace like Canterbury Cathedral, these huge cathedrals in England, oftentimes they don't have enough people to fill these huge churches on Sunday morning. And so they'll seat everyone in these enormous choirs that they have. Uh, a number of years ago, 
we went to Sunday morning communion at Canterbury Cathedral and the entire congregation sat in the choir stalls. Now the altar rail, this is the rail that separates the chancel or the sanctuary from the rest of the, the building. And this is where typically you come and kneel to receive communion. Now, like many things in, in the liturgy and in church design, this actually had a very practical purpose when it was first instituted because people would bring their animals and they would have markets and all sorts of things in the church building. They needed a way to separate off the sort of the holier space from the common space. And so the altar rail was really this fence to keep the animals out of the chancel. Um, and now we use it as a place where we can come and kneel and receive communion. Then we have the lectern, the pulpit, and the ambo. So those are three terms that refer to very similar things uh, in, in a very traditional church design you will have um, two places where people speak from. You'll have, so at All Saints, we have the place where the readings are done from, and that's called the lectern. And then the place where the preaching is done is the pulpit. And they're on two different sides of the church. Now, a lot of churches have moved to only having one place where, where all the readings and the sermon are all done from. And so if it's a, if it's a multi-purpose reading stand, it's known as an ambo. Um, so my church in Colorado Springs for a long time, we were, it was such a small space, we didn't have a separate pulpit and lectern. So we simply had one place and that was known technically as the ambo. Uh, in our chapel, we have an ambo. The missile stand or altar desk is simply the thing that we have on the altar that the priest puts his book on so he can see it. And then we have what's known as a credence table. And a credence table is a table in the sanctuary where all of the vessels and elements for communion are placed before the service. Now, all Saints technically does not have a freestanding credence table. Um, there's, a, there's a shelf behind the altar, and I, I was going to put that in here and I forgot, but that's known as a gradine shelf. And so we use the gradine shelf as our credence table. Uh, now, what's interesting, when I was in Colorado Springs, um, when, we, when we started St. George's, and we really didn't have anything. And so we had to kind of piece things together. And someone donated just an end table from next to their couch to serve as our credence table. But it really wasn't big enough to hold everything. And so we had to put a little footstool underneath it to hold some of the things that we couldn't fit on the credence table. And we were doing uh, a liturgics tutorial for some new chaplains. And, and one of them was looking at it and he says, Now what? What's the theological significance of the smaller table under the larger table? And we had to tell him, well, it's because we couldn't fit everything on the larger table. <laughs> and that was, that was a good lesson for him that oftentimes things are done practically and not simply theologically or liturgically. The font is where we do our baptisms. At a, a Baptist friend, I was showing him around the church and I showed him our font and he said, what do you do with that? And I said, well, that's where we baptize people. And he said, how do you fit them in there? <laughs> um, so our baptismal font at All Saints is actually about 600 years old. It predates the Reformation. It came out of an All Saints chapel, I believe in London. Um, but because we're in the belt of the, or the buckle of the Bible belt, we have a lot of people who want to be fully immersed for baptism. So we have actually a big uh, cattle trough that we'll pull out for immersion baptism. We'll put it in front of our baptismal font. 
oftentimes in churches you will have uh, behind the altar a really ornately carved uh, screen and this is known as a rare dos um, so they can they can be really ornate like this one at all saints our rare dos is very simple it's it's simply wood um, we had a really cool one when i was in colorado springs and it was a bit of a mystery to a lot of people as to oftentimes they'll have carvings of different people and i knew who all the people were in our uh at grace church um in our rare dos there and so i would always i'd always make bets with people that they couldn't guess who all the all the people were in our rare dos a processional cross is a cross that is used to lead the procession and they can be very simple they can be very ornate uh, i've been in parishes where there are multiple processional crosses <clears throat> i think when i was at grace church in colorado springs when i first got there it was a huge church and so we would actually i think we had three different processional crosses one that would lead the procession and then another that would be behind the choir and another one that would be right in front of the clergy um, at all saints we only have one processional cross and it'll probably stay that way at least for the time being we also have torches and tapers. A torch is a candle. You see that one on the left. And acolytes typically carry these in and they represent the light of Christ coming in to the church. Uh, they actually had a very practical purpose originally. Um, all candles in the church were practical um, back before electricity. It was a way that people could see the torches were meant to lead in the way for the servers so that they could see where they were going. Um, they were used to light the, the book so the priest could read. When the torchbearers come down with the gospel procession on stand on either side of the book, the original purpose for that was so that the deacon could read the gospel lesson. Um, but because we have electricity now, there's no practical purpose for it, but there's still a liturgical theological purpose. It represents the light of Christ coming in. Um, and then we have the taper, which is used to light candles and extinguish candles. Uh, they're typically longer, so it makes it easier to reach tall candles. Um, and there's a snuffer on one end of it <clears throat> that you can use to extinguish candles so you don't have to blow them out, which um, can be unseemly in the midst of the liturgy. Now, we don't see this a lot in the United States, but if you've ever been to an Eastern Orthodox church, you'll notice that in their chancel, <clears throat> there's actually a wooden screen that's in front of the altar. And I think I... I supplied at a church in Colorado once that had a rude screen like this. And it was, it's a way, especially in the Orthodox church of really separating out the holy space from the mundane space. And in the Orthodox church, they're completely solid and the priests will go back behind there and you don't, you actually don't see anything that happens during the consecration prayer until the priest brings the consecrated elements out from behind the rude screen. Um, if you see them in an Anglican church, they're typically more like this, where you can sort of see through them, but not completely. Then we have the thurible and the boat. So if you were at our uh, 11 p.m. Christmas Eve service, this is the one time we break out our thurible, and this is what we use for incense. So the thurible is the thing on the right. And so you, it's attached to, um, to chains so that you can swing it. And the top pulls up and you'll put coals and incense in there. And then you can smoke up the church and make it smell really good. The boat is the vessel on the left. And it's, it's a very fancy looking contraption. And its sole purpose is to hold the incense. Um, just because it looks a lot nicer to carry that in than it does to carry in a baggie of frankincense. 
The Paschal candle is also known as the Easter candle. And this is a special candle that we bring out for the Easter season and it stays lit from the Easter vigil all the way through the day of Pentecost. Um, we also will bring it out for funerals and um, I think funeral, I think funerals, maybe ordinations or confirmations, baptisms will bring it out as well. Uh, now, interestingly enough, we don't have our Paschal candle out at All Saints now. And part of the reason for that is that our Paschal candle is huge. And when it's in our normal chancel, it looks very appropriate. But if we tried to put it in our chapel, which is a very small space, it would be way too big for the space. So as soon as we start doing public worship again, we will bring our Paschal candle back out. It will remain out um, through the day of Pentecost. Now, a lot of churches will have what's known as a tabernacle or an ombre. Uh, the purpose of both is the same. They are places used to reserve consecrated elements. So bread and wine that has been consecrated but hasn't been consumed, and so it's being saved either for the next service or so that the priest can take it and bring communion to the homebound or the sick. Um, the difference between a tabernacle and an ombre, a tabernacle is typically a freestanding box, whereas an ombre is built into the wall. Um, now, in the Anglican 39 articles, it is said that we are not to reserve the sacrament. Um, and that's because during the time of the Reformation, the Catholic Church was saving consecrated elements so people could come and worship those elements. And so that's what the, the articles are trying to get away from. And so we don't encourage people to come and worship the elements that are in the ombre. Uh, but we save them for practical reasons, so we always make sure we have enough elements to, to have communion. You'll see on the, next to the ombre on the right, there's a candle, and that's known as a sanctuary lamp. And that candle, if there are consecrated elements in the ombre or in the tabernacle, there's typically a candle either above it or next to it or close by it that is continually burning to show that there are consecrated elements in there. What is the now, symbol on the front of the tabernacle? The symbol in front of the tabernacle. Uh, so the symbol on the tabernacle, that is a Cairo. So those are, those are the first two Greek letters of the word Christos. Um, and so that's what's known as, th there are a number of uh, monograms for Jesus. So when they would hand write all of these things, oftentimes they would shorten names to a monogram so they didn't have to write the name out all the time. And so you actually have on the left, you have the Cairo, which are the first two letters, Chi and Rho of Christos. On the right, if you look at the, the image of the host above the chalice on the ombre, it looks like IHS. And if you ask most Protestants, they will say, well, that stands for in his service. That is actually incorrect. That is another uh, monogram for Jesus. And those are the first three letters of the name Jesus in Greek. Uh, so that's what those two symbols are. Okay, so you will often hear people, well, <laughs> at least back in the olden days, I don't know how often you hear it these days, but if you've got someone who's an old school Anglican, old school Episcopalian, they will sometimes refer to the gospel side and the epistle side of the church. So in terms of orientation, where the altar is, is always considered liturgical east. Uh, back in the old days, they would always build churches facing east-west so that the altar was placed at the east end of the church. And that's because 
we know when Christ returns, he will return from the east. And so the idea is we are all facing east so that when Christ returns, we will see him and not have our backs to him. Um, all Saints is actually oriented on an east-west axis, um, which you can tell, especially right around the middle of March, um, because the sun will be shining directly in that rose window above our altar at about 8.30 in the morning, and it can really blind some people during that, uh, that early service in the springtime. Okay, so you've got, right now looking at this picture, we are facing liturgical east. So from liturgical east, if you go to liturgical north, that is the gospel side. And if you go to liturgical east or liturgical south, that is the epistle side. And the reason for that is because oftentimes the epistle would be read from the lectern, which is traditionally on the south side. And the gospel lesson and the preaching would be done from the uh, north side or what we would call the gospel side. And so that's just a way that, because if you say, well, I'm sitting on the right side of the church, and you say, well, are, are you sitting on right as I come in from the back or right as I'm looking at it from the front? So if we say gospel side, epistle side, it's like saying port or starboard, or it's like saying stage right or stage left. Um, the the side doesn't change based on your orientation. It's based on the orientation of the church and the altar. So if I tell you, go sit in the third row on the gospel side, now you'll know what I'm talking about. A piscina is a special sink, typically in the sacristy. And it is a sink that does not drain into the normal plumbing of the church. It drains directly into the ground. And the reason for this is to dispose of consecrated wine, you either need to consume it, which is the preference, or you need to pour it directly into the ground and not into the plumbing. And so we have often in the church a piscina for for either pouring out excess wine or even for cleaning out the communion vessels. So you make sure no excess consecrated wine goes into the plumbing. Um, a lot of times they will be kind of these special things built into the wall. At All Saints, our piscina actually looks like a normal sink. If you go into our sacristy, we have two sinks. One is a normal sink and the other sink has a cross above it. And so you know that that is our piscina sink that drains directly into the ground. All right, now vessels and linens. <clears throat> so chalice, paten, and ciborium. So the chalice is the big cup that we drink from. A paten is a flat plate. Um, that the communion hosts are on. And the ciborium is a larger, almost looks like the chalice itself, but it has a lid. And that's where excess uh, communion hosts are placed. So at All Saints, we actually have a paten um, that goes on top of the chalice. And we usually put that off to the side. And uh, we have everything in it sort of looks like a ciborium without the stem, and that's simply known as a host box, and that's what we consecrate our, our communion wafers in. And actually what's interesting is our, our communion chalice and our communion ciborium are almost identical. And I've actually toyed with the idea of using them both as chalices so that we have uniform chalices and using our second chalice as a ciborium. But I haven't done that yet. A pix is a small container that will fit three or four communion hosts, and we'll use that if we're bringing communion to someone who's homebound or someone who's in the hospital, we will take a communion host and put it in a pix 
so that we can take it there and we're not just walking around with consecrated elements just jug jingling around in our pocket in a plastic baggie. Uh, wine and water typically go in cruets. These are smaller glass vessels, usually with glass stoppers and handles. And then oftentimes you'll have a larger vessel known as a flagon, where you will have extra wine. So we have a, a glass flagon that we put in the ombre with consecrated wine. And then we will pour from the cruet into the chalice and consecrate wine in the chalice and in the cruet. And then you have water. You always add a little bit of water to the wine. There are all kinds of different explanations as to why we do that. Um, practically, that practice started because in, in ancient times, wine always needed to be cut with some water because it was much, the, the wine making process was very different. So the wine was much thicker. Um, we have a much more refined process for making wine now, but as so often happens with uh, liturgy, something that is practical when there's no longer practical need for it, it, you wind up giving it other meanings. So oftentimes people will say, that the pouring the water in the wine is uh, in remembrance of the water of the blood and the water that poured out of Jesus' side when they pierced him on the cross. Now we don't typically do this at All Saints, but I did it on Easter, where we took the the chalice and we put the paten on top of it, and then you veil it. So you put over top of it what's known as a veil, that's the, the cloth covering. And then on top of it, it's two pieces of board uh, that are hinged together, and that is known as the burse. Um, and I, I really like having a veiled chalice. I think it adds some color. Uh, you usually put it on the altar. And so it's a good, it's a good sign of what we're doing on Sunday morning, that we're celebrating Holy Eucharist, and it's a reminder of the color for the season that we're in. If you remember our class from last week, red is the color for Pentecost, and it is the color for ordinations and confirmations, and it's also the color for Holy Week. So this is this chalice is veiled for either Palm Sunday or Pentecost Sunday. Now, I would love to do this every Sunday, but we don't have veils and verses for all of our seasons. I think we only have a white one. So if anyone wants to donate veils and verses for the other seasons of the year, so we'd need a, a green one and a purple one um, and a red one, I would, I would be more than happy to, uh, to put that on the altar every Sunday. Um, a Paul is essentially a piece of, of stiff cardboard that's covered in linen, usually with a cross in the middle of it. And that goes on top of, if you look back here, the, the chalice is underneath there, but the thing that gives the shape and the form up on top of the veil is the pall. So you put that, you put the chalice down, you put the patent on top of the chalice, you put the pall on top of the paten, and then you put the veil over top of the pall. A corporal is a special linen that is square, and it is folded um, into thirds and then thirds again. And if you look at this picture, you'll notice the folds are all going down. And the, the purpose of the corporal is essentially to catch the crumbs. Um, and that's where it gets its name. It's from that root word corporeal or flesh. And so the idea is any, any crumbs from uh, the communion bread that falls on the corporal get folded up within it so, so it doesn't wind up just falling on the floor or, or being left on the altar after communion. And so we'll usually put this down first on top of the altar, and then we put the chalice and the paten and all of the other things that are being consecrated on top of the corporal. 
The lavabo bowl and towel, this is simply a bowl that's used to wash the priest's hands before the before the consecration of the communion elements. Um, this is a very pretty brass bowl. I think the bowl that we have at All Saints is a candy dish. <laughs> it's just etched glass. Um, and then the towel next to it is the lavabo towel. And the lavabo towel is sometimes confused with the purificator. So the purificator is the small towel that the chalice bearers use to wipe the rim of the communion chalice after people drink from the chalice. And the, the size of the purificator and the lavabo towel are pretty much identical, but you'll notice that there is uh, some embroidery on, uh, on the purificator. And on a purificator, that embroidery is in the middle. And so you'll fold it into thirds and then thirds again for a purificator. Uh, a lavabo towel, the embroidery is towards the bottom in the middle. And so the uh, lavabo towel is folded in thirds and then in half. So, so you can tell the difference because of how it's folded and because of where the embroidery is. But I will say, we have a wonderful altar guild at All Saints and a lot of them have been doing this a long time. But every now and then I'll get a lavabo towel instead of a purificator. Um, and so I, have, I actually have a secret stash of purificators up behind the altar so that when that happens I can go, grab a purificator rather than a lavabo towel. On top of the altar, there's usually a white linen known as the fair linen. And the purpose of the fair linen is to protect the altar, uh, especially if it's a wooden topped altar. It's a way of making sure that you don't get stains on the altar. Um, what's interesting is I've, I've been at places where you have so many things on top of the altar and they're all trying to protect the other things. So you've got the, the fair linen and then the altar guild gets worried that something's going to spill on the fair linen. And so they put things on top of that to protect the fair linen. And then they say, well, something might spill on those. So you put something on top of that. The point of the fair linen is to protect the altar. So occasionally, wine does get spilled on the fair linen. Um, and it's, it can be a pain to clean and iron, but that is the point of the fair linen. Um, and that's actually the point of the purificators as well. I had, <laughs> I had someone once tell me, well, Father Eric, you need to talk to the chalice bearers because we keep getting wine on the purificators. I said, well, yeah, but, but that's what they're for. Well, but if we keep getting wine on them, we're going to ruin them. I said, well, yeah, but that's what they're for. That is their sole purpose is to get wine on them. So, well, there was never wine on them when Father Doug was here. <laughs> I said, well, someone was doing it wrong because that's, that's the whole point of the purificator is to get wine on them. Um, now, I, I do tell people when I'm training them how to be uh, chalice bearers to not get wine in the embroidery itself. Um, uh, the purificators in, uh, in this picture have red embroidery. Oftentimes, it'll be white embroidery. Um, but if you get lipstick or wine inside the stitching of the embroidery, it can be really hard to get out. But there are special tricks that I'll often teach the chalice bearers of how to avoid getting wine and lipstick um, on the purificators. All right, finally, well, actually not finally, but let's talk a little bit about church setup. And there are all kinds of different ways to build churches, to design churches. Uh, we're not going to go through all of those, but I'm just going to give kind of a few examples of different ways that churches are set up. The traditional way for a church to be set up is what's known as traditional or cathedral design. 
Um, so you have the narthex, if you look <clears throat> all the way at the left, so this would be liturgical west. You have the narthex where people enter, and then you have the nave. You have the two transepts, the pulpit, the lectern, the chancel, the sanctuary, and the apse. So this is a very traditional, and this was actually modeled off of the medieval court. So when you would go to see the king, this is how the royal court was set up. And so it was very intentionally done in the same manner as a way for the church to say that Christ is our king. And so instead of a throne at the front, you have the altar or the communion table um, to show that Jesus is the king and not some earthly king. Some churches uh, set up in the round. If you've been into our chapel, our chapel is kind of semicircular. So uh, the idea here is everyone's on the same level and it's more focused on, on the communal nature of worship rather than uh, this idea of God the King sitting on his throne. And then this is probably the most popular design, um, especially this part of the country, which is simply the auditorium design. And this is set up to look, it looks like a movie theater or a concert venue. Um, now, I don't want to be overly critical, but the way we set up our worship space says very important things. And when you have a setup like this, where Jesus is king, and it's all very stately and organized, it, it says one thing about God. This says, hey, come and be entertained. Um, so I'm not saying that the gospel is not being preached from, from places that are set up like this, but, but you come in, and, and it's a very different attitude and a very different sense and a very different purpose for what is happening. And finally, let's talk about clothing. You'll notice within Anglicanism, uh, as in uh, other denominations, we will often wear uh, clergy shirts and collars. And people have often asked, well, what's the difference between the two collars? So you have the neckband collar, which you see on the left, and you have the tab collar, which you see on the right. Um, so is there a liturgical or a sacramental or a theological difference between these two styles? No, there's absolutely no difference. There's no distinguishing. We are permitted to wear either or. And so it's often just a preference. Um, the, the tab collar is a lot easier to manage. So, so a lot of people will go with the tab collar. I kind of like the neckband collar because I don't get confused as much for uh, a Roman Catholic priest if I wear a neckband collar. Plus, I think the neckband collar, it's a great symbol. I had a, a little girl, she was three or four once, and I was wearing my collar and she asked me what it was. I said, well, do you ever, do you ever see anything else wearing a collar that looks like this? Uh, maybe a dog. Have you ever seen a dog wear a collar? She said, yeah. Seen a dog wear a collar? It looks just like that. So well, why does why does a dog wear a collar like that? What does it mean? I don't know. So well, when a, when a dog wears a collar like this, it means that that dog has a master, and and that means that that dog has someone that he obeys. And so when I wear this collar, it's because I have a master who I must obey, and that master is God. Um, so it's a it's a great teaching tool. Uh, it also, you know, the black in the shirt is also meant to represent our fallenness and our depravity, and the white in the collar represents our redemption that we have in Christ. Um, and so I've, I've always resisted wearing, you know, blue and different colored clergy shirts. I'll wear black, sometimes gray. Um, but I've, I've always been of the mind that the clergy shirt is not the primary place to make your fashion choices, uh, black or gray. <clears throat> and then we have the cassock on the left, and this is 
a long black robe um, that's usually worn over the clergy shirt. And the cassock actually isn't technically considered a vestment. Back in the olden days, this was just sort of normal everyday wear. Uh, and the vestments go over top of the cassock. Uh, so the surplice, you'll see on the right, this is a long white uh, garment that goes over top of the cassock. And again, um, this is, it's a great teaching tool because the black of the cassock represents our sin and our fallenness. And then we put on the white surplus over top of it. And just as we're covered in the blood of Christ, so that God no longer sees our sin, he only sees Christ's righteousness, that um, when we put the surplus on, we no longer see the black of the cassock, we only see the white of the surplus. And you'll see there on the right, there are two different styles of surplus. The one on the left is what's known as an American surplus. And it typically comes down a little below the knee um, and has uh, narrower sleeves. The one on the right is an old English surplus and that tends to be longer, it comes down almost um, about halfway down the calf usually, and it has much fuller sleeves. Uh, so I, I typically wear an old English surplus. Um, when you see our deacons wearing their cassock and surplus, I believe theirs are American surpluses. Uh, so those are the differences. Now, we will wear these. Um, cassock and surplus can be worn for any liturgical service. Um, we will typically wear them for morning and evening prayer. Uh, if I'm preaching and not celebrating, I will often wear cassock and surplus. Um, during Lent, my plan was to wear cassock and surplus for all services in Lent to kind of set the season aside. Um, but then we had the coronavirus and all our plans got shot. Um, but that is cassock and surplus. Now an alb and a cincture an alb is a white robe that is usually tied in the middle and often has a hood. Now, a little bit of the history of the alb. Back in the old days, the alb was actually a simpler garment that went over top of the cassock. And it was sort of, it was a different version of uh, the surplus. And then there was another, a separate hood that went with it. Um, at some point, they combined the cassock and the alb together into what is technically called a cassock alb, but most Anglicans simply refer to it as an alb. Um, so our, our acolytes usually wear albs, our uh, lay Eucharistic ministers, our talus bearers will wear albs. And if I'm the celebrant, I will often wear an alb underneath my chasuble. Now clergy will wear stoles. And stoles are a symbol of, of the authority of the ordained ministers. And you see here three different types of stoles. On the left, we have a priest stole. And a priest wears the stole over both shoulders. Uh, sometimes if he's wearing uh, an alb, he will cross the stole in the middle and put them through the cincture, which is the rope in the middle. Um, the, the stole typically corresponds to the liturgical color of the season. So you'll see this is a green stole. So it would be worn during ordinary time. Uh, we're in the season of Easter now. So we're, we're wearing white stoles now. Uh, and a stole can go over top of an alb. It can also go over top of a surplus. Uh, the one in the middle, this is a deacon's stole. It looks very similar to the priest's stole, but for the deacon, it is, his stole is worn over his left shoulder. Um, and this is a symbol of the diaconal order. So if you see a clergyman wearing, excuse me, a stole over both shoulders, he is either a priest or a bishop. If he's wearing a stole over the left shoulder, he is a deacon. 
And then on the right, you have what's known as a tippet. And this is also called a preaching scarf. Uh, and this is, um, the tippet is typically black and it will often have the, the patch of the person's seminary on one side and the diocesan patch on the other side. And uh, the tippet is usually worn with cassock and surplice at a non-Eucharistic service. So if we're having morning prayer or evening prayer or something like that, instead of wearing a stole, so we'll wear a stole for any service where there's a celebration of Holy Communion. If there's no celebration of Holy Communion, we'll wear the tippet. And priests and deacons wear the tippet over both shoulders. Um, and so sometimes if, if Deacon Robert's preaching, even if we're doing communion, he'll wear a cassock and a surplus and his tippet rather than uh, his stole. If he's not serving as the deacon for the service and just as the preacher, uh, he'll wear his, his tippet rather than his stole. And then we have the chasuble and the dalmatic. And these are two Eucharistic vestments. The, the chasuble is the one that uh, Father Nathaniel lovingly refers to as the Christmas tree skirt because it looks like a Christmas tree skirt. It is a round garment with a hole in the middle, basically like a poncho. And this is worn over top of an alb and stole, usually by the person who is the, the celebrant at the Holy Communion. The dalmatic is a similar vestment worn by the deacon. And the dalmatic, uh, the big difference between the chasuble and the dalmatic is the dalmatic actually has sleeves. Um, so it's not, it's not a round garment like the chasuble. So if you look at someone and they're wearing something really fancy over top of their, their alb, if it doesn't have sleeves, you know that that's the priest. If it does have sleeves, you know that that's the deacon. Now we also have some funny hats that sometimes we wear. The one on the left is known as the Beretta. And I actually had a Beretta <laughs> in Colorado Springs that I would occasionally wear, but I think it got left in Colorado Springs. And then the Zichetto is, uh, looks like a beanie or a yarmulke. Um, and typically it's the more high church Anglo-Catholic folks that, that wear the hats. Um, we typically don't wear a lot of hats at All Saints, so I'm not sure you'll ever see a Beretta or a Zucchetto at, at All Saints. So some additional terms, and we went over some of these uh, when we talked about Anglican polity, but this is probably a good review nevertheless. Uh, the rector, the term rector, is used to refer to the head priest in a parish. And so people will often say, well, what's the difference between a priest and a rector? And um, every rector is a priest, but not every priest is a rector. So the rector is the senior pastor. So it's, it's like the difference between a pastor and a senior pastor, the difference between a priest and a rector. Uh, the vicar is typically the priest of a smaller parish or a mission congregation. And so Father Nathaniel is technically the vicar of the table. And then a curate is a new priest, usually in his first parish. So before Father Nathaniel became the vicar of the table, he was technically the curate at All Saints. The vestry is the governing body of a parish. Uh, so this is our lay board. The senior warden is essentially the president of the vestry and the junior warden is the vice president of a vestry. And so our senior warden is John Hutchinson and our junior warden is um, Mike Allen. <laughs> I was blanking on Mike's last name. And then canons, if you ever hear us referring to the canons of the church, these are the laws or, or the rules of the church. So you have what are known 
as constitutions and canons. And so the constitution kind of lays out in general how the church is to be run. And then the canons talk about how you apply those rules. Uh, so that's been one of my jobs. We, uh, our convocation of the Mid-South, we are working on becoming our own diocese and every diocese needs to have constitutions and canons. And so I'm actually on the committee that is putting together these constitution and canons. Um, and it, it can be mind numbing work to say the least, <laughs> but it's important because when you run into situations where you need to apply the rules, you need to have a written accounting of how, how you are to do that. Uh, it's essentially like the bylaws of the diocese. Those are your constitution and canons. <clears throat> and then rubrics are the liturgical directions in the prayer book. So if, if you have a prayer book and you look through it, all of the directions, I think, let me check our new prayer book. Uh, typically, they are in red. Um, I'm not sure. No, our doesn't look like our rubrics are in red. Back in the old days, all the rubrics would be in red. Now they're simply in italics. But things like the congregation stands or the people kneel or um, – the sermon is preached here. All of those directions within the liturgy are known as the rubrics. 